Amen. Doesn't the band sound great? Let's thank God for, thank God for them. <laughs> Father, thank you for this morning, and Lord, we thank you for our mothers on Mother's Day. I certainly thank you for my mom. And Lord God, we pray that you would help us uh, to see uh, how you, um, Lord, have revealed yourself and the things that you have made, even our moms. We pray, Lord, that you would shine your light on us today. We need your redemption. And Lord, I know that as we preach this sermon, no one will fully understand this sermon, but I pray that you would help us to believe your word as, as we continue preaching about what we preached on last week, the light. We, we can't comprehend the light, but Lord, you are the light and you can comprehend us. So do that this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning's message is a continuation of last week's uh, message, Ephesians 5, 8. We're preaching through Ephesians, you know. At one time, writes Paul, at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. We talked about the idea that God who is light doesn't make dark. And yet he makes space and time for dark. Just as God who is love does not make not love. Yet he makes space and time for us and our darkness, our lack of love. We talked about we each cast a shadow in the light. Uh, we cast a, a shadow uh, and we create a shadow self, a self created with our own will, with our own self-centered desires and, and dreams. But God creates a new self with his will and his dreams, and his dreams are called, class, reality, correct. You get a free donut downstairs after the service. No, no more donuts, sorry. A cookie or something. Go to the kitchen, Lori, just look around, eat something, okay? <laughs> Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 14, Paul writes this, because we're talking about dreams. Awake, O oh sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. You ever tried to wake someone from a deep and dreamy sleep? Unless you hate them, you do it gently, right? Invading their dream world with the real world can just about kill them. When you dream your own dreams, you are in total control. Your mind manufactures your reality, your own reality, and when someone wakes you, their reality invades your reality and annihilates your illusions. If they love you, they'll whisper. They'll whisper in, in the hope that their voice will enter your dream and be incorporated into your dream and gradually wake you from your own private reality. Wake you as you freely surrender your shadow reality to their reality, a common reality. If you trust that voice whispered into your dream, if, if you trust that voice and receive that word, your waking will be a delight. But if you don't, if they startle you, you can have a heart attack. One summer night, about 26 years ago, I was leading a service up at church camp with my, my best buddy Dave when he got a call and found out that his new bride was leaving him and wanted a divorce. And so together, Dave and I, drove from Santa Cruz to Los Angeles. I remember I uh, dropped Dave off at his place and then I drove over to my place. It was about three in the morning. I drove over to my place where my bride was sleeping, dreaming her own dreams, three in the morning. At that time of Susan's life, her fears often got the best of her, and her dreams would become nightmares. We lived in a dangerous part of Los Angeles, and when I was absent, she felt vulnerable and naked. She also felt empty because she wanted children, and things weren't working out. 
her womb felt empty and void. I was her husband, bound to her in a covenant. I was to cover her and fill her place of shame with myself and my seed. Hope that doesn't bother you that I talk that way. Paul's going to be talking that way in just a few verses. I was her husband and she was my bride. Like Christ is our husband and we, the church, are his bride. Well, I just remember standing at the door wanting nothing more than to cover her and to fill her with myself, knowing that she wanted nothing more than to be covered and to be filled by me, but she was asleep in a dream, her own dream. I remember trying to be so quiet, I accidentally jiggled the lock or something, and from the bedroom, I heard the sound of absolute terror. Who is it? Oh my God, oh my God! And, and in that instant, I knew that her dreams had turned into a waking nightmare, for in that instant, she realized that whoever was at the door had absolute control. And so she believed that soon she would be raped. And in that instant, I remember I so wished that I could have entered her dreams and whispered to her, sweetheart, sweetheart, I will never rape you. I'm your husband. But if it be your will, then I will to make love to you. So awake, O oh sleeper, rise from the dead, and I will give you light. I will give you life. You know, some of you wonder why Jesus just doesn't all of a sudden, boom, show up in all of his glory in the middle of the church service. Maybe he'd prefer that you surrender control because he's just not into taking control. Maybe he's whispering to you right now. Ephesians 5 eight. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all that is good and right and true, and discover what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is a shame it is shame, it's filth, to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will enlighten you, epiphany you, give you light. Look well, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeem the time because the days are evil. The word translated redeemed is used only like four times in all of scripture and all by St. Paul. In Colossians, we are also told to redeem the time. In Galatians, Paul uses the word twice, explaining how Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, Galatians 3.13. On the tree, he bore the pain of our shadow man. Remember we talked about that last time, the shadow man, he bore it upon the tree, and on the tree, he gives birth to the true man, the eternal man. There he redeems us, Galatians 4, 5, redeems us, and he sends his spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Daddy, Father. Redeem the time because the days are evil. As we said last time, evil is an absence, not a substance, a nothing that infects the something, a desecration upon creation. Evil is like a parasite. There can be no evil apart from the good. God is good. But God did not make evil. God didn't make evil any more than the light makes the dark. Darkness is an absence of light, visible light. Evil is an absence of God. 
who is light, but not just visible light. God is light and love. God is I am that I am. Evil is darkness. Evil is not love. Evil is I am not. Evil is that which God does not will. So God did not create darkness, but he created space and time for darkness. God did not create evil, but he created space and time for evil, just like he created space and time for me, even to will that which he does not will. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form, chaos, and void, empty, and darkness was on the face of Tehom, the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, the chaos, the deep, and God said, let there be light. John tells us that God is light and that Jesus is the light of the world. And so when God said, let there be light, he was saying, let there be me in the not me, the nothing. So, before God could create out of nothing or in nothing, he had to make space for nothing. Because God is the ultimate something, right? God is I am that I am. So you see, the Big Bang was not an explosion of somethingness in the nothingness. That's the way we think about it, right? The Big Bang was not an explosion of somethingness in the nothingness. It was an explosion of nothingness in the somethingness. Not an explosion of fullness in the emptiness, but an explosion of emptiness in, in the fullness. Not an explosion of light in the darkness, but an explosion of darkness in the light. For God is light. And now human words and concepts totally fail us at this point. Prepositions don't work. For prepositions assume space and time. But before space and time, and there was no before, of course, but before space and time, God is all that there is. Light is. I am am. Isness is like like this god is all that there 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 is so the big bang was like an explosion of not god in god nothing in the something darkness in the light like this you see i think creation must have hurt god space and time hurt God, like a, a wound in God. You know, we are created at a wound in Jesus' side, at a wound in the eschatos Adam's side, the bride of Christ is created. We are created at a wound in his side as he hung on a tree, bleeding light into the darkest night. Creation must have hurt God like a wound in God, or a womb in God. Aram Haratunian wrote this, I think it's beautiful. He wrote, in the beginning, God, that's it. Before space was made, there was only God. Not some dark, cold nothingness, but light and life itself. And what did God do at the beginning? He made space. He made space within himself for others to be. The very act of creation itself was sacrificial. God made space for others to exist. Space and time are a wound in God. And if you're a mom, you've felt that wound. You made space in your life for children. In other words, you made space in your life for pain. But you made that space in hope. Hope that one day they would return your love 
in freedom. Your womb is like that wound in God. But you don't need a womb in order to feel that, that wound. Just love someone, and you make space for that someone. The space uh, to will what you do not will. In other words, you make space for pain. Well, God made a void. He made space and time, and then into the darkness he spoke his word, and his word is light. He is the light of the world. He, he is the promised sperma, the promised seed. He is how, did you get that? He is how God creates. 380,000 years into the Big Bang, as we measure time, according to physicists, the cosmos was infused with light. God said, let there be light. The light of the cosmos. Cosmos is Greek, it's translated world. The, the light of the world. God said, let there be light. And in that light floats our world. See the light? Because this is the weird thing. You usually don't see the light so much as see other things by the light. What we think of as dark, empty space is actually full of light. It's just that there's no matter for the light to, to bounce off of. And, and what looks like light, that ground thing in the middle there, that, that earth, what looks like light is actually the edge of darkness. Darkness is in the depths of the earth, to home in Hebrew, the deep. So we think space is dark, lifeless, empty, and void, and earth is light, living, full, and solid, uh, like this. But maybe space is light, life, full, and solid, like heaven, and the earth is dark, dead, empty, and void, as hell. In the cosmology of Scripture, you know, we live between light and dark. We live in the firmament between the waters of life above and the waters of chaos below, between light and dark, heaven and hell, life and death, full and, and empty. It's interesting to me that in the worldview of our ancestors just a few hundred years ago, okay, not 2,000 years ago, but just a few hundred years ago, in, in that worldview, hell, all that's below, is as big as heaven, what's above. But if the world is round, hell is like a dark bubble of nothingness floating in a sea of light. Like a wound in the light. The sin of the world. Well, we exist on the skin of that bubble. See us up there on the top of the skin of the bubble? Standing on emptiness, we, we should be standing the other direction on what's solid. You know, people say that the cosmology of Scripture is just ridiculous to think that heavens, the heavens, this heaven means sky, that the heavens are full and the earth is empty. I mean, to think that spirit is eternal and matter is, is temporal, uh, ridiculous. Uh, we say, well, we sent astronauts into the heavens and, and it was empty. I find it fascinating that the discovery of the Higgs boson particle, you've been reading about that, and the Higgs field, well, it, it turns out that according to physicists, outer space now it looks to be anything but empty. And quantum mechanics indicates that it may be far more full than matter. They call it the energy of the vacuum. Professor William Tiller of Stanford states that the current theories now indicate that the amount of latent energy in the empty space in one hydrogen atom is a trillion times greater than the energy in all the mass or matter of all the planets and stars out to 20 billion light years away. I mean, that's incredible. Don't know how true that is, but you see, maybe the Bible is right. I mean, maybe the things that we think are empty are often quite full. And the things that we think are full are often quite empty, which means you can be just like full of yourself and profoundly empty. Well, in Scripture, the depths of the earth are empty. Empty of light and love. It's called Hades. 
translated hell. But one day, a great day, according to scripture, the earth will be filled, it will be flooded with the glory of God, and God is light. And check this out, one more fascinating tidbit about light. Light is eternal. Darkness is temporal. And so hell is temporal. I mean, it may last for all of time, but time comes to an end. This earth will be flooded with eternal light and fire, and this old earth will be transformed into a new heaven and a new earth. World without end. Do you sing that when you were a kid in church? We used to sing that all the time. Oh, man, I guess it's, I don't know, it's something. World without end. Why is it without end? Because it's full of the end. And what's the end? Jesus, the light of the world, beginning and end. Well, yeah, say it quick. Yeah, that's okay. That's right. We live kind of on the skin of hell. Hell even starts in this place. And so Jesus, the light, though, is the beginning and the end. Okay, so listen to this. John writes this, Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the tahom, the deep, was no more. And I saw the new Jerusalem. Yes, okay, Santino, you can, you can stay, just wait till the end, okay? So listen to this, Revelation 21. I saw, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the tahom, was no more. And I saw the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for her husband. She has the glory of God, and the city has no need for the sun, for the glory of God gives it, it, it light. Its lamp is Jesus the lamb, and there is no night there. You see, the light doesn't just shine on her, the new Jerusalem, the bride. The light shines from within her, and so she casts no shadow. In time, we're like the old Jerusalem and her shadow. That old Jerusalem still is casting quite a shadow. In eternity, we are the new Jerusalem. In time, we're the old man. In eternity, we are the new man. The old man casts a shadow, and yet the old man is surrounded by light. Paul wrote this, in him we live and move and have our being, like dark bubbles in the light. So you see the shadow the old man casts is inside himself like the shadow in the depths of the earth. See, that's a picture of me and the shadow. (laughs) As, As Paul wrote, at one time you were darkness. But Paul already wrote this. He, Jesus, the light of the world, descended into the depths of the earth that he might fill all things. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. For the Lord, you see, is light in you. When we surrender our darkness to the light, when we surrender our lies to the truth, our judgments to his judgment, our shame to his grace, our death to his life, our chaos to the logos, our emptiness to the fullness of God, our self to Jesus, then our old man is annihilated and the eternal new man is created or revealed in his place. Same shape, but no longer empty, now full. No longer dark, now light. 
no longer temporal, now eternal, no longer evil, but now good, no longer dead, but now alive, no longer alone, but now in love, the image of God, and we are the new Jerusalem. We are the bride of Christ. And scripture says this, this crazy thing. The Jerusalem above is our mother. And so this should really make your head spin, but we give birth to ourselves, <laughs> our new selves. The, uh, uh, this is your problem. You're, you're pregnant with yourself. Your old self is pregnant with, with your new self. We give birth to ourselves. We give birth to each other, and we give birth to Christ in others. You know, Jesus called us his mother. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother. We give birth to the fruit of light. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faith, hope, love, everything good and true. When we surrender our darkness to the light, we give birth to life. Because the light is our husband. I'm not saying that a womb is evil. Got that, all you moms out there? I'm not saying that, that a womb is evil. I'm saying that refusing to surrender your womb to your husband, who has bound himself to you in the eternal covenant of grace, at the price of his own body and blood shed on the tree, in the heart of darkness, is... The womb is not evil, just like space and time is not evil. The emptiness and longing that you feel is not evil, but bride of Christ sur refusing to, to surrender your womb to the great bridegroom is evil. In, in, in other words, refusing to surrender your space and time to the great bridegroom is sin. You know, people wonder why Jesus is so concerned about bad sex. It's because he's so passionate about righteous sex. It's a picture of creation, all creation. And it's through you, Eve, that the last Adam longs to create. And so the prince of darkness, what does the prince of darkness want? He wants you to cover your shame with more shame. He wants you to fill your emptiness with more emptiness while the Lord whispers into your fallen and deluded dreams, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I will fill you with light and life. Well, God created space, and God created time. And now physicists say that they're really one thing, space-time. Well, in Ephesians 1.10, Paul wrote this, that there is a plan for the fullness of time. Not simply to, you know, kind of wrap things up in time, but uh, to fill all empty time with meaning, and Jesus is the meaning. To fill all dark time with light, and Jesus is the light. To fill all sinful, evil time with grace, and Jesus is God's grace. To fill all temporality with eternity. So Paul writes this, at one time you were darkness. But now, now is the point that eternity touches time. Now is the point that we make a decision or that we agree with God's decision. At one point you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And then he writes, redeem the time for the days are evil. What days? The plural days. The days of, of, of time. I mean, it's kind of like what Santino was saying just a minute ago. This is his first weekend without his mom, first Mother's Day without his mom. And the days, the days are evil. This is a dark, dark place, this world. The days. In the last chapter of Zechariah 14, verse 7, Zechariah prophesies. He prophesies, and there shall be a unique day. That's the ESV, King James, one day. RSV, a continuous day. One unique, continuous day, which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night. I think that means there'll be no more passage of time as we experience it. But at evening there shall be light. And on that day, living waters, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. 
and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name one. The days are evil, but that one unique eternal day is good. In, in Genesis 1, God creates all things in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested for everything is good. The seventh day is holy. No evening is mentioned on the seventh day. On the seventh day, there is no evil. On the seventh day, creation is finished. On the six days, it is not finished. There's still darkness. And the days then must be evil. Even though they contain good, being spoken into the darkness by the Father of light. Well, if you take scripture at its word, you'll see that we're still being created in time. And not everything is good. Don't know if you've noticed that, but not everything is good. And so the history of time, beginning to end, must look something like this. The six days are in time, and the seventh day must be eternal. So if you're feeling kind of temporal, oh, maybe you're living, existing in the sixth day. But if you have those moments where you feel a little bit eternal, like eternal life, maybe somehow you're living in the seventh day. Now, now people with, with, with a modern mindset think that's, that's crazy, but recent cosmology reveals that the cosmos, if, if the cosmos is about 14 billion years old from the standpoint of the earth, Due to relativity and time dilation, it must be about six days old from the standpoint of creation, when matter was first formed. You know, it was at the end of the sixth day of the week that Jesus the light hung on a tree and cried, it is finished. It must also have been the end of the sixth day of creation, for Paul says that we have come to the end of the ages in Christ. We have come to the end of time in, in, in Christ. Or you could say perhaps that the end of the ages has come to us in Christ at his tree. Whatever the case, we Christians believe that the boundary between space, time, and eternity is a tree called the cross. There God redeems us from the curse by becoming a curse for us on the tree. And there God gives us his life. There the light penetrates our, our darkness and bears the fruit of life. There the tree of knowledge becomes the tree of life. You know what a tree does? Do you have a tree in your yard? A tree takes light from heaven and mixes it with filth or dirt from the earth and produces fruit. Well, on the tree, the light of the world bore the sins of the world and invaded the world, all space and time, with himself. In the Revelation, he enwraps the scroll and gives meaning to all time, all of time, the days of time, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven bowls. At seven, everything is new, and he cries, Behold, I make all things new. He redeems time with himself. And Paul writes, redeem the time for the days are evil. We, we, you can't redeem time. But maybe you can surrender your time to the Redeemer. By the power of the Spirit, you, his bride, can speak the words at the end of the Revelation saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. You can invite him to fill all your space and all your time at this point in time called now because he has already accomplished it in eternity. I don't think I even began to believe or comprehend any of this stuff until one day several years ago praying with a friend. This friend had come to Susan and I for help. She shared some horrid pictures from her past. Pictures were of ritual abuse when she was a child. She called them pictures. They were, they were memories. Demons attached themselves to these 
places of darkness and shame. And on this occasion, she shared several pictures, and I'll tell you about one. One of them was a memory of a Halloween night when her mother dressed her in an angel outfit. And that had always been her dream, to be a an angel. But that night, after trick-or-treating, her father came home, saw the outfit, grew furious, took her to a meeting where she was stripped, placed on a table, and ritually molested. It was all that she could do to tell me because of the shame. At one point, as we prayed, she had a vision, a vision of Jesus. And when she saw Jesus, I remember she, she cried, Jesus, please hold me, please, please hold me. Would you hold me? And he wouldn't hold her. He said, you have to give me those pictures. In her mind, she was literally clutching these pictures to herself. And Susan would also see these things as we would pray for her, clutching those pictures to herself, ashamed to, to surrender them. I prayed, Jesus, would you please show her who she is? Because I figured she was not those pictures. And, and Jesus said this to her, those pictures are part of who you are. I remember I, I wondered if this is Jesus, and I prayed some things to kind of like check on that. I thought, surely these pictures are not who she truly is. These pictures are darkness. They are, they are not light. And, and I wanted Jesus to annihilate those pictures, and, and my friend wanted Jesus to annihilate those pictures, but he would not annihilate them. In fact, he framed them after he enlightened them. One by one in this vision, my friend would hand a picture to Jesus, and with each one, she'd have another vision. And Jesus, the light, would then appear in each picture. He'd annihilate the shadows and give each picture new meaning. He, he finished each picture with a revelation of his love. Each picture was like Good Friday, transformed into Easter. Each picture was like the greatest evil, like the crucifixion of Christ, transformed into the greatest good, the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, darkness was transformed into light, bearing the fruit of light, as my friend would begin weeping in gratitude, crying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Then Jesus would take that picture, that piece of space-time, put it in a frame, and hand it back to her. Finished. It is finished. When Jesus entered the last picture, the one I told you about, he, he entered as a warrior. He went to that wretched table where my friend had been abused, picked her up, held her to himself, and then he dressed her in his white robe, his angel outfit. He set her on his lap and he told her how hard he had fought for her and then he said this to her. You are and you will always be my little angel. As she told me this, I said, well, do you see it? He, he is holding you. Now he's holding you and he is telling you who you are. And Jesus said to her, your pictures are my pictures. You see, it's who they are. Where evil has told her, you're a whore, Jesus has told her, you are my bride. Where evil has told her, you're the mother of death, Jesus reveals, no, you are the mother of the living. Where evil has told her that she's worthless, the Prince of Glory reveals that she's worth his body and blood. In the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there it will be said to them, you are my people. Where she was darkness, she is eternal light, in the Lord. You see, Jesus fills all of her space, and he fills all of her time so that it becomes their space and their time. I remember my friend looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she said this. She said, how do you think it makes God feel when we're ashamed of those pictures? And I said, I, I guess it would mean that we're ashamed of him.
Do not be ashamed of the Jesus that hangs on your cross in your space and time. Jesus fills all your space and all your time. That's why he created all your space and all your time. That he might be glorified in all your space and all your time. So you don't have to hate your space and time. Just the emptiness that fills your space and time. Don't hate your space and time. Surrender your space and time. To redeem the time is to surrender your time to the Redeemer. In prayer, in the now, then you can surrender guilt in the past and it becomes a story of grace. You can surrender fear for the future and it becomes uh, faith and, and hope and, and courage. You can surrender the present moment and it becomes the obedience of love. Then on that day, you will see that all your space and time has become the kingdom of heaven. It's eternal. But if you hide your shame, cover your fears, if you take refuge in the dream of your own control that you are your own savior, creator, and redeemer, if you cling to darkness and lies and illusion, you cling to hell. And here's the rub. Jesus will not rape you. Jesus will not fill you unless you ask him to. Jesus will not rape you, and yet he is romancing you all the time. That's why he made space and time, so that the light could shine in your darkness. Light is eternal. Light is the judgment. Light is alive. But this is what our dark hearts have not suspected. The light is our friend. And even more than that, he is our lover. You were made from the light <coughs> for the light. Your greatest desire is to be filled with the light. The problem is that you're dreaming your own dreams and your dreams are dark with shame and fear. Well, like I was saying, it was three in the morning. My keys jiggled the lock, and out of the darkness I heard my bride. Who, who is it? Who? Oh, my God, oh, my God. And my, I remember my heart just broke for her, and I, I said, Honey, 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 it's me, it's me, it's me, your husband. And she knew my voice. I think you know the bridegroom's voice. He's the word spoken into your dreams. I mean, even now, he's speaking to you. He's the beauty in every sunset. He's the truth in every statement. He's the rhythm in every song. He's the light. Surrender to the light. I, I said, honey, honey, it's, it's me. And, 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 then, and then she hugged me like I have never been hugged before. And I hugged her like I had never hugged her before. Her personal nightmare turned into our, one of our greatest memories, and I said, I won't rape you, but if you will, I will to make love to you. And I covered her, and I filled her, and she bore the fruit we named Jonathan. <laughs> Maybe not that particular night, but sometime around there. So would you close your eyes, just wherever you are, close your eyes and listen. It's dark. This world is dark. It's dark and you have been dreaming your own dreams. You've been living your own life according to your own will. And there's a sound at the door you realize it's judgment day. I truly believe that right now you have been placed before the very throne of God, the judgment seat of Christ, and you, my friend, are not in control. 
He is in complete and absolute control, and so you brace yourself, expecting to be violated. Now open your eyes and watch what happens. The light of the world on the darkest of all nights takes bread and he breaks it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same way, after supper, he takes the cup, saying, this cup is the covenant. You see, he forms a covenant with you, his bride. This cup is the covenant in my blood, in my blood. Eat it. Drink it. Do you see what he's asking you? Now, would you let me fill you? Pray with me. And, and you can just say these things with me in your heart. Just make my words your words. Lord Jesus, I, I give you my past. I give you all those places where I've hated myself where I've been ashamed of myself, where I have dreamed my own dreams of darkness, I give you my past. I give you my future and my fears, my fears about uh, what I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna make it, how I'm gonna pay for things, what's gonna happen to me, I give you my fears. And I give you my present, I give you right now. Jesus, I invite you to fill all my space and all my time. Turn my shame into your glory. Turn my future into your courage. Turn my now into your obedience of love given to the Father. Thank you that your desire is to hold all of me. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we give you praise. Amen. You know what that is? That's God's dream. And what's another word for God's dream? Reality. Good class, that's awesome. And you are agreeing with the dreams of God. You see, he's romancing you. And it will happen because it has happened, it's eternal. And so I can say this to you, church. Happy Mother's Day. Because you give birth to light in this dark world. And it's conceived. This is an amazing thing to me. It's conceived in your place of shame. <laughs> That's where we encounter God's grace and bear the fruit of life. We'll talk about that more in, in the weeks to come because Paul said it. We, we haven't, I think, gotten to the heart of it quite yet. He said, whatever is exposed to the light becomes light. You see, God is good, and he does not fail. And so his gospel is great. Believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey there. I hope the message that you just heard or viewed helped you to believe a little more that God is better than you thought, the love of Jesus is deeper than you know, and the Spirit is everywhere working the wonders of mercy. If that's so, I'd love it if you would consider two things. Number one, ask yourself if there's someone that you know that might benefit from this message and then uh, forward this link on to them. There are several ways that you can do that by visiting our website at thesanctuarydowntown.org. Secondly, I'd love it if you'd uh, take just a moment and uh, ask the Lord if He'd like you to contribute 
to this endeavor financially. We really can't do this except for the fact that God inspires people like you um, to give. And uh, you can do that by uh, going to the website and clicking on uh, the donate button or uh, by simply mailing a check to the sanctuary downtown at uh, 2215 West 30th Avenue, Denver, Colorado, 80211. Uh, thanks for being a part of what we're doing, and God bless you.